So we've just finished filming our new Tough Love episode. You might have noticed I'm wearing a Techno Team shirt. This is a part of our long awaited first batch of Dust Techno Team merch. We're gonna produce it in a very limited amount and we're gonna pre-sale it in March. So make sure to make your pre-order on time because as I said, super limited, unisex, genderless, four sizes. We're going to have small, medium, large, and extra large. Let me show you the t-shirt from the back. It's white writing on black fabric. So make sure to make your order on time. It's limited. It's our first release, first batch of Techno Team t-shirts. Get yours and join the team. Press play, I mean. Okay. <laughs> you turning the lights on with that? In this studio, I could imagine that it would work. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, where should we start from? Uh, it's probably obvious that uh, this uh, episode is not the regular tough love episode that uh, we've got uh, we've gotten used to in the last uh, what was it more than a year already yeah yeah started like November November 2022 I think we filmed the first one and it's uh, like eight episodes yeah right yeah that would be that would be the ninth uh, episode of tough love right and uh yeah a lot of mixed feelings but uh we always look forward we always look uh to the future we always try our best to to spiral up and uh be positive not blindly pink pinkish positive but uh, blackish positive <laughs> yeah we, we have a little bit of pinky latex behind us which is uh a beautiful creation, by the way, of uh, good friends of ours, an architect uh, office that designed this, uh, the interior of this place. We're at, uh, I, can, I can tell the whole story probably if I already opened up. Yeah. Yeah. So this place we're at right now is the uh, Water Tower Studio uh, next to our headquarters. It belongs to good friends of ours. Uh, and yeah, it was designed by also by friends of ours. And uh, we're very grateful that we could uh, use this uh, this super nice uh, place for our uh, yeah new episode, and uh, we have uh, an old new member, <laughs> uh, old new founder, co-founder and founder of uh, the Techno team, Mark Maki Maki Solomon Maki Gela. He has a lot of he goes by a lot of names, and, and there's only one me, <laughs> but there's only <laughs> one him. Him, he, him, and uh, <laughs> okay. he goes by he, him, I think. I never asked you, do you go by he, him, or? I never really, really thought about it, but yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can so, call me Mark. <laughs> can, can I? <laughs> A lot of people think that uh, his maki uh, uh, has something to do with uh, sushi, but it's actually way more than that. Yeah. I have no way. idea what it is. <laughs> So, uh, two words, I, I told you about the location, now about who are, uh, you're seeing right now in front of your screen. Uh, the, the big Solomon, the judge, the, the, the prosecutor uh, uh, has been there uh, from the very first beginning. He was uh, one of the major uh, uh, inspirations and, 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 uh, and thinkers in the process of, uh, of the Stekno team and us creating in general. Um, we can tell more about that, about our beginnings a bit later. Uh, Marky is the producer of, uh, of, of Tough Love. He was there behind the camera all the time, sometimes uh, communicating with us, but mostly silent, uh, the silent surfer. Yeah. 
<laughs> always yeah he, i don't know if he means that right now or just in general he was the one pushing the time and uh, pushing us to the limit but holding us to to the limits as well because uh, yeah rob and i we could uh, go for hours uh, bullshitting uh, non-stop so yeah that's the guy uh and uh He's uh, there today. He's here today for uh, for a reason. We wanted to make this episode uh, special. We wanted to uh, to talk about a lot of stuff that we have until now, but especially to 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 talk uh, and and to remember our dear friend and uh, rave brother uh, Rob uh, or Kaizen, as you might know him by, by his social media nicknames. Uh, Robbie has. Uh, uh, passed away um, not so long ago, as you probably heard or saw uh, on our post, or yeah, maybe you just heard of it uh, from other sources. We would rather uh, not to talk about it uh, right now, like in like in terms of the circumstances and the reasons. There is a lot that we don't know. There is a lot that uh, we uh, yeah that we have we don't have also the right to, to talk about because this is uh his family's thing and it should stay his family's thing and as soon as we know something or as soon as we will be able to tell more we will definitely share it with the community i know you're probably interested to know uh, more but for now the most important thing for us is to to remember him to preserve his legacy and and to to keep doing what we were doing and starting and, and continuing because first of all because it's fun second because i think there is a value in in, the, in what we do uh, rob and us we got so much feedback through the last couple of months about the podcast about the importance of us speaking out about stuff that uh people are usually in our seen uh, are afraid to talk about afraid to open up about so we really feel the importance of uh, of of these issues and i want to tell you here and now officially this will go on definitely full power full on we will have uh, more guests we will have more discussion we will have more uncensored uh, stuff happening here in terms of conversation at first i think <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we, we really find it important. Tough love is going on. Uh, I hope that this is what Robbie would also l like us, uh, want us uh, to do. Uh, he really f felt his, his mission and the importance to, to, do, to do so and to, to share his uh, learnings and his uh, knowledge with, with his community and with his uh, friends and also with people that are completely new to our... Uh, world or sub world or sub genre so yeah first of all uh marky marky it's uh at this point i just want to say a big yes. thank you to the community of rob of our community that like you know like the, all the messages and like the help of like this they had like trouble with the transportation yeah his family had home. some uh, some uh, hard circumstances with yeah. uh, with the logistics of his funeral and so on and yeah. and the community helped and big thank you to the community thank you for that and yeah, yeah. his i think his brother started this uh, this uh, fund uh, fundraising and they really did uh, super well more than they needed and from what we understood the, the excess amount will go to a an organization that rob uh, was supporting so we'll definitely update on that and can and keep you on on board yeah so thank you for the support the support was real <laughs> so maki a couple of words you want to you want to maybe introduce yourself more than more than i did deeper a little bit or just to say hello what, what can i say what an introduction <laughs> you know, it look, took like 10 minutes or something i don't know <laughs> you earned it respectfully yeah thank you yeah we created together a techno team what can i say i think it was basically like more or less like an idea that i have but like the how it looks now or whatever what it became it completely on your side like the visual stuff mine i would say is just concept conceptually like the podcast is like a thing that i pushed already like for for a good time you know like 2021 yeah. Yeah. we're talking about it yeah so yeah 
Yeah, you I think you do, you said everything. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah. If we want, if we want to talk about the origins of the podcast, we can also go into that a little bit. You you've been so you've been into YouTube and content creation uh, way before me. I was just yeah. a consumer, and uh, we can also refer to the origins of Techno Team and and yeah. and Tough Love. So we were doing our shit. We were doing our business. Our normal daily life projects i used to be i used to be a dance trainer marky we we met at the university marky was uh, studying then we started doing a business together and everything was going kind of a uh, classic classic uh, okay yeah. yeah till the pandemic of course came uh, we just finished up a, a big project uh, building up the dance school and our business was going pretty pretty well and um, then the pandemic came and uh, during those years before the pandemic uh, both of us which is also the next topic both of us uh, were uh, becoming hard ravers i would say 2018 2019 uh, we were uh, yeah we were like the bonnie and clyde of uh What's, what's the song like we fucking ravers or something oh uh, like? yeah like <laughs> <laughs> ravers. yeah so yeah it's just a loop it's being used in a couple of tracks so uh, yeah 2018 19 uh hard times in the good way and then the pandemic comes and then we're sitting uh in our uh, on our projects and like we cannot do anything our daily business was had to close for a couple of months the dancing school had to to close and we thought okay so we have a location and we don't have we don't have the club, so we don't have really have to have anything to do uh, during the day, but we don't have a place to, to take our steam out like the Berliners do during the weekend. We really missed the club and we really felt that there is no real representation of the club aesthetics or, or the techno aesthetics in a way that we see it online. Uh, Marky was talking more and more about about uh, social media about social media presence mm -hmm. and about uh, content creation and so we decided to be the first ones or to be the first ones from our perspective to present this secret world in a way that we like it or in the way that we envision it uh, to the outer world this reminds me this uh, press text reminds me of uh, the press text of your favorite bouncer what if you again, get it again, you get explain, it explain explain so there is like your favorite bounce of your favorite club okay. who does like the same stuff, just like an expo where he wants to bring this underground world to show <laughs> different faces behind it. Oh, you mean this reminds you of Nachts? Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that clearly. But, <laughs> but I once like watched like, uh, like a short bit of him. Yeah. And he's like telling the same stuff, you know. Okay, so short background: <laughs> the bouncer of Berkheim did a did a, um, a, a photo gallery where he presents the, the 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 types of people that go to Berkheim or the artists of Berkheim, so people can get a glimpse into that into that uh, festival, even being out, outsiders. But to be honest, I've been there, and most of the people there were from the inside, so they all know each other. Uh, what I think, uh, what we tried to, to to create, what was important to us, is to make a more, I think, a universal a picture of, of what we saw because first of all we don't stick to one small niche of a musical genre for us techno is more of a of a world uh, vision uh, the germans would say friede for the eierkuchen you know um, we see techno as a point of view to the world and not only as a, as a genre so the first uh, ep episodes that we were creating were more about hey we love that track marky said okay you a dance teacher Create a dance. Move how you would move, like uh, in the club. And I'm like trying to go into this, uh, into this uh, trance in the mind, uh, and to move naturally as I would move in the club. We were starting to film it. Super cringy in the beginning. Uh, we we <laughs> yeah, tried. Videos to, were awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We tried to we tried to pitch it. We pitched it to a to a company. We cringed uh, from our, our pitch was even cringy to ourselves at that time. So uh, yeah, we decided to go a little bit of different direction. Started to working to work with uh, students of mine that had no clue what what uh, really what techno was, and we were trying to choreograph and to rebuild a picture that we had in our minds. So the outcome was at the end, of course, different than what when, what we had uh, experienced. But it was a pretty nice welcome, maybe to people that never been to techno. Or it was a hard cringe for people who have been and they were, you know, hating hard, but then starting to, to love it. And 
after some time the the hustle and the and the consistency we had with this uh proved us that we're on the right path the pandemic was uh the pandemic was over we can get back to the things that we did during the pandemic but uh, techno team was already was already born you yeah know? but back then there was like no representation of techno and yeah in social media it was like uh still is by like the old school people it's still like not appropriate to post anything yeah for a lot of people it was like uh, okay so there's the the whole niche of you're not allowed to photograph yeah. and suddenly you have during the pandemic a lot of famous djs suddenly uh broadcasting themselves standing in front of yeah. a dj booth and uh, putting these videos out like uh, Ben Clock pay, playing the Berlin TV Tower and stuff like that. People that you usually would not stand in front of the camera. And we're yeah. thinking, okay, we are part of this wave of opening up because people are now in their homes. People are can only consume what what uh, isolated uh, what they what's what's on their phones, and there is no actual way to to have this experience. Uh, the, the way it was before, yeah. So these two two three years of 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 I would say isolation for mo for most people because yeah we're we're a little bit of uh, criminals in that in that uh, in that perspective. But I also have to add like that we never filmed during a party, you know. So yes. this whole TikTok movement of like yes. people filming inside of parties this is like how often people see us. Like we portray people from parties yes. in parties or some stuff. That's yes. not happening. We have our studio. We film videos, portraying it as a memory. Yes, as an as an art piece, whatever. Yes. However, you see it, but uh, it's like a bit different. People mock it for being like never teach uh, how to dance to techno, but it's also not about like actually the teachings. I mean, you can learn something of it, but it's about the picture there, that you have. There are uh, two main reasons for the f um, for this club rule of no filming and no photographing allowed. Two basic reasons. The first one is when you're not living your experience through the, through this, you're living the moment. You're in the moment. And the second reason is the one being filmed. People don't have to be afraid or to they don't have to anticipate being filmed so they don't feel harassed, so they can feel more free, they can go out of themselves and experience it. So so it's the the, the reasons are like in front and behind the camera, the experience is better. When we film and we create, as Marky said, we just recreate experiences. And when we rave, of course, we hide our phones. Of course, we sometimes there is a moment where you just want to take out your phone and you and you make a photo. We we laughed with Rob about it. I think in the first yeah. episodes, you make a photo at the end of the rave, or you we had a lot of those. And and then you're you're. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's just like an after photo, like a mug shot yeah. before and after. Yeah. But it's not in the club. And usually you, know. you regret making that photo, yeah, sure. but it's a good memory <laughs> that you have it, you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a memory. I don't know if it's good. <laughs> yeah, so there are, of course, way more pros for for the for this, uh, how should I call it, fabot? How, how would you say a fabot? Uh, restriction, I don't know. Restriction? Yeah. Fabot, okay. Let's call it, yeah, the, the, the camera restriction at raves is a good thing. But if we try to call the techno culture a culture, then it has to have some kind of a legacy. And you can have a legacy only if you can save, preserve, and display. Okay? So the, like the indigenous people of America have proof that these or these or these lands are there because mm -hmm. there's proof that they were there. They if there's like some wall paintings. Yeah. If aliens come here in uh, 50 years and uh, there is no proof that raves even existed, then, uh, you know, this part of human culture has disappeared. If there wouldn't be uh, videos of Love Parade, no matter how amateur they are, yeah, they are, the, these videos you can see on YouTube, on Instagram, they're still viral because people are eager to consume this knowledge and this information and these memories from such a colossal event in the in the 90s and thanks to those thanks to even the idea of dr monte to go out on the street and show who we are and not hide anymore in bunkers and 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 and, and cellars thanks to this people know about it you know so i think we should be less uh uh gatekeeping and and afraid that somebody will see us raving if we are in a circle where we want to be in private circles, we just don't film. But if somebody films you on a festival and you dressed up in an outfit that you planned for weeks, 
then of course you want to be filmed. Of course you want a memory of it. And as long as this person asks you ahead, yeah. is it okay for you? Is it okay for you uh, if, I, if I photograph you or, 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 film, or film you and you get this memory and you can hold it forever and your kids and grandkids can see, wow, my grandpa was the hardest raver, you know, or my grandmother. Uh, so, yeah, so just don't forget about it. What we're doing is really keeping memories and, and, and recreating them. We like to see ourselves as artists. I think we don't have to prove that we are artists. If we consider ourselves artists, uh, we observe and recreate something from our memory or intuition or, 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 uh, or the skill that we have uh, shaped the, the, these years. And that's basically art. As an artist, he observes, he recreates, she, he. And uh, yeah, so so much to... Uh, Sounds quarters. like almost like excuses that we... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so defensive. Well, I, I, just, I, just, <laughs> I just think that a lot of people in our audience like us, but still like to criticize. And yeah. that's okay. We're, we're in for an open discussion. And we are more than ready to, to show you our points and why we ourselves have different, even each, of, each one of us has different opinions in, in our heads about like photographing and filming uh, a rave and uh, why and why not. And, and, uh, and where is the, we talked about appropriation. Let's talk about appropriation for oh, a no. second. <laughs> Mark's favorite. Oh, no. <laughs> a lot of people like when we create a video yeah. and say, these are techno voguing hands. Uh, you have all the voguing scene, uh, ballroom scene uh, on their legs, and like, uh, what are you doing? You're appropriating. I said, I said to Mark a couple of weeks ago. I think that appropriation is only then, or could be considered appropriation, when, when a project, when an artwork is done bad. You know, if the if the work is bad, what is bad? Yeah, but if the artwork is not giving me anything then it's appropriation. Okay, I have one question. So yeah. like the first time I heard like this term uh, appropriation, whatever, yeah. was like when Drake started to do like this more life album where he did like a song that sounds more housey, more like uh, what we listen yeah. to maybe. Like, so what was the appropriation album. there? So that he is like a hip hop artist mm -hmm. and he appropriates like house music. Okay, so this was, he was accused by some people. Yeah, so uh, he was, uh, so it's uh, one time and the other time when he like appropriated the slang of UK grime. Okay. So he like uh, talk like big man thing, <laughs> oh, <nice>. yeah, <laughs> kind of stuff, you know? And this is like, he's not from the culture, obviously, because yeah. he's from Canada or whatever, yeah. <laughs> not a rave or whatever. Yeah. And he's taking it, making it big, getting famous through it or more famous through it and cashes in the 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 lorbeeren we say in germany yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh bay and leaves no not bay leaves the other leaves i forgot Doesn't but matter. yeah so he getting the credit but not not the scene so this is the terms how i first heard about appropriation okay so, so what what, are you, what what you what you're talking about is mainly like a genre and aesthetic appropriation he takes something from the house and from the grime but it's also cultural appropriation because grime like or or, or mm -hmm. um, like uh, black british uh, heritage has also its his, his uh, its history and drake is kind of repurposing it yeah. for and he's cashing out at the end. So that's appropriation. Yeah. But we're okay. not cashing out, so we're not so First of all, yeah. So again, we don't have to go to self-defense in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's stay in general terms of what is appropriation. So there is genre appropriation where I can immediately say it cannot, genre appropriation cannot exist because genres are just different aesthetics. It's, it's as, if, as if you're painting something abstract and painting something super uh, realistic and you mix both in one painting, you mix two styles and somebody will say, you're appropriating the exhibitionist or you're appropriating this. Uh, if you decide to use those two uh, of those styles in your painting, your painting is something new based on old knowledge. Okay. okay, so Drake so, didn't appropriate so house music. So in terms of genre, I don't think that he appropriated okay. anything. Mm. But then the other part, cultural appropriation. So there's a funny video on YouTube, maybe we can cut this in uh, mm. afterwards, where a guy uh, dresses up as a Mexican uh, caricature, like, uh, like, a me like, an, like a Mexican exa exaggeration. Sombrero, punch, poncho, and so on. And he goes on the streets and only white people approach him and tell him, 
the, what you're doing is disgusting. It's a it's cultural appropriation. And then on purpose, he goes to Mexican people <laughs> and asks them how they feel. And they say, they feel totally cool about it. They feel they feel nice about it because it, these are their symbols. And he's like, uh, it's not that he is mocking them. It's not that he is uh, using some uh, uh, cliches against them. He's just taking a symbol and wearing it. Uh, of course, if there is like again indigenous people in America, if there is something violent in the hist in this history of, of 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 this certain culture, and it's being not only repurposed but perverted in the new usage, then it's maybe appropriation. But then, as I said, it's a bad job of the artist or the creator. I think that. Uh, Okay, I think that we as humanity, sorry for jumping so uh, to macro, it's getting we deep as, now. as humanity, <laughs> yeah, I think we have a collective knowledge. I think we have a collective uh, consciousness, which we are not usually not touching enough or not using enough. And everything that every human ever created in terms of cultural assets belongs to everybody as long as we are not hurting the freedom of each other by using it. So if I'm going to use your heritage without insulting you, without insulting, so I have to know more about it, I have to understand more. If I try to create now an Indian song, I have to learn about it, at least the basics, so I can recreate maybe a techno track with some Indian uh, aspects and maybe I should consult myself with, a, with an Indian producer, yeah? to respect your culture while I produce something that is completely new and I have a complete right uh, to do. So if Drake worked with some grime uh, artists on this, on this album, and which he did, I think, which he probably did, yeah. he then respected the history of it and created something new. And that's uh, coming back to what is appropriation, what is not. If I just saw once a YouTube video with, with, a, with a cultural, uh, um, with a cultural uh, explanation of like two seconds about uh, something and I create a new project completely based on that surface knowledge, I do a bad job. I do bad research. I create at the end a bad product, which is like, like my, my raw products were, were, were bad in this dish. But if I go into research, I learn a little bit. I learn this movement, this movement, this movement, and then I create one dance from all of them then it's maybe not an appropriation. I can totally understand why we got uh, these accusations of, of being appropriative with, uh, with techno voguing hands, because we didn't really go to voguing lessons uh, before, uh, before creating those videos. But on the other hand, those videos were exactly the criticism that we had about people in the techno scene kind of voguing while they dance in the club. And at the end, we were just portraying this. We were not portraying uh, a, a voguing choreography that we made up. And like, this is what a lot of people think. They think that most of Techno Team videos are, you have to do this in the club. This yeah. is a must do list. Instead of try to um, maybe an advice to those seeing, watching Techno Team for the first time or just asking themselves, what is the idea behind it? I don't want to explain too much, but try to see it from a different perspective. Try to see it as a suggestion of developing a skill of movement to sound. It doesn't mean that you have to do it, but it does mean that you can try it and make your own experience out of it. Or you can just watch it and tell us what you think. Yeah. But in terms of voguing again, or in terms of other uh, movements or dance moves that people found uh, to be cringy or strange, these are all results of observations that we had in the club. We don't call names. We don't say who this was. Maybe we were those, you know, maybe these were friends of ours or somebody, but these were moments that we saved, recreated, and that's how it looks at the end. If you feel offended by it, then maybe send us your version of techno voguing and we would be more than happy to, you know, to share it on our platforms. Uh, Still looking for uh, true Gaba Habar. Yeah, Haber, <laughs> Haber uh, dancer. Gaba. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, so Haken. Haken is the right uh, term. Ah, so Gaba the is the name of the dancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a Gaba or dancer? she's a Gaba. Okay. He's a Gaba. He's a Gaba. Mm -hmm. That's how you use it. I didn't know it myself. So yeah. thanks to our friends who, for clearing this out. 
we are still looking for a hack. We had some 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 uh, people approach us on on uh, like uh, on our DMs and so on, but still we didn't film any episode with uh, with an appropriate not appropriating uh, Haken dancer, and we're still looking forward to it. So feel free and, to approach us anytime. And I'm personally still looking forward for hearing a good Gabba track. So please send some. <laughs> <laughs> Was it criticism? Mark is sti he's still on the search for good Gabba music. So because <laughs> it's trash. <laughs> So yeah. Sorry, no. If you I'm feel comfortable <laughs> about, if you feel uh, confident about your uh, hacking uh, hardcore, hardcore, or how whatever Happy you call hardcore. it, yeah, send us all the core and the hard and the hardcore music that you have, and we'll judge it. Yeah, judge it. Why not judge? We will incorporate. I think it's part of the electronic dance music scene, yeah. so you can you can deny it anyway. Yeah, we you know, will. Even, we, yeah, even if I personally don't like it, it's still a big part of it. So you yeah, know, the whole festival scene and. Holland or Netherlands, yeah, Netherlands is like the biggest, right? Holland and Belgium are like the yeah, biggest yeah. Uh, festival nations. Yeah. So yeah, you can't deny them. So yeah, we, definitely we need to represent them. Definitely. People got crazy because I said that some of the moves remind me some, uh, give me some junkie vibes. Yeah, whatever, you know, some of the moves in techno also give me some junkie vibes because there are some junkies if all over see, the scene. You see some German shepherds in the first Yeah, row. if you watch our <laughs> old episodes, you see some moves that we got, uh, like that were born out of inspiration of us staring at junkies, you know, so take Let's it Let's don't call them junkies like party people. There are party people that consume, there are party people that don't consume, and there are party people that overconsume. you know? Party people is like, I think the... And we the portray headcom. all of them. We portray all of them, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. When we say to somebody, uh, or tell a story about, about a junkie, we don't see it that negatively as most people will, would do, you know? This person has a problem. <laughs> you can see it, you can see it in their behavior, you can see it in their uh, gestures, and that's okay. We're not judging. We're not telling you this is wrong and this is right. And we never said GABA is wrong or right. A lot of people in our comments did. A lot of people in our comments were like straight away going to, yeah, GABA is shit. GABA is not a music, blah, blah. Or the GABAs themselves who just started defending their culture. As Marky said, this is all under one rooftop of electronic music and rave culture. So drum and bassers, GABAs, uh, what ambient about, junkies. What about dubstep? <laughs> Dubstep <laughs> is, uh, I'm just kidding, yeah, everything that is electronically produced is, has the right to be called electronic music, you know, I think today, at our times, nothing is produced analogly anymore, so in an uh, analog way, so even hip-hop nowadays is electronic music, it's uh, just a yeah, big, okay. big rooftop uh, term, so everybody's welcome with their uh, consume uh, habits or without them, uh, no judgment here, and uh, yeah, just uh, you know, keep up, uh, keep up the good vibes. Stay. Uh, why, why be so serious? You know, if we say that somebody moves like a junkie, then uh, you know, maybe we think that way. It doesn't mean it's a fact. Could be that this someone is completely sober. I saw some people that maybe move he's like just junkies. loose by nature. I know people that can really loosen up and go to in a trance uh, state uh, with no drugs, and their, their way of movement is so loose that you would think, you know, like uh, kind of hippie ravers that move like uh, heroin junkies and whatever, <laughs> whatever. You know, what's the problem? This well, is their way of problem? movement. These are my connotations. I saw somebody maybe on heroin, and now I think, okay, this guy moves. Have like you ever seen somebody on heroin? I, I personally, okay, except of Cottbus or somebody, I you know. Some, was, uh, uh, yeah, yeah? I got some, okay, so I didn't, I maybe saw a junkie on heroin or something, but I got a very interesting story about a party in Kiev that we never been to in, in uh, Atel, uh, so hotel, it's a, it's a, it's a small club in, uh, in, in Kiev, and I heard about uh, a traditional party that was going on, a series of parties, and I just heard of one of those parties, and... Um, you know, people mostly like gather in underground parties or raves by their c consumption because uh, usually people on the same frequency or vibe, like let's say this party is like methadone people, they would gather together. This party is like more the ketamine people or the G people. Sometimes they meet on a big party like Berkheim and all the consumption is there. But usually these, uh, these communities kind of uh, have similarities in their, in their consumption. So I heard of this party in Kiev where they were all heroin <laughs> users. 
that sounds like some uh, thing that the politicians would say about like yeah. Ukrainian <laughs> ravers. They all use heroin. There. You I know that? Wait, I, 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 it's funny question. Uh, funny thing that I remember. Sorry that I'm interrupting <laughs> you. But like, uh, I had like this conversation with my grandmother, <laughs> and she and she like knew that we are like going to raves in Kiev, and she's like, so, uh, kid, like. You're like in the into the the, the night scene here, huh? so do you really use heroin there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, say? we use way worse shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. So, how did your grandma uh, hear about your uh, rave uh, b belongings? I don't know. I just said uh, I'm here and I need to leave for a party later. So, ah, okay. see you. Okay, okay. See so you. from that, yeah, from now on, you're the night scene. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, she's just like, where are you going? Electronic music. And like my father then said, like, yeah, that's like the narcoman scene. So <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, your father wait, what? Really? What like, so, but, 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 <laughs> but watch out there. Yeah, people yeah. use there. <laughs> I've been to Vienna like a couple of months ago and uh, this Uber driver, like, uh, we just needed a short ride, like two kilometers inside town from the hotel to a bar or something. And like uh, 100, 200 meters before the, the destination, he turns to, 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 to my, my, girl, my girl and me and he's like, uh, you guys be careful there. They like, and they do other stuff as well, you know. Yeah, like same shit worse. in Kiev, yeah. And I'm sure. like, uh, please uh, tell me where. And tell me where exactly so I can find them, you know? I had the same in Kiev, like a taxi driver saying like, we're going to K41 and he's like, uh, watch out, this is like where the gay people are. Like, what <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> okay. If I could come to any city in the world yeah. and just ask directly in the airport, where are the gay people, where they hang? I want to go there. I would love it. I think there, there should be an information uh, counter in every airport in the world, <laughs> like an LGBTQ or just queer. That queer. sounds like some apartheid shit right yes, away. It's apartheid, <laughs> but I don't care. I want to be where the gay people are. They know how to have a good time. <laughs> they have the taste. I don't care. Yeah. I'm an ally. We're allies, you know, I so, so I don't want those uh, sober muggle uh, touristic uh, shit counters in, in the airports. <laughs> Nobody goes there. The grannies and the grandfather should go to book a tour bus for fifty bucks. You know, I want to know where the where the where the real taxis yeah, are working. We need you to know, see where the, the real slums. I need the real taxis, not the. the we need to see the sewers, <laughs> like where yeah, they cook yeah, the meth. I, I, yeah, I think we can. You you can really know a town. A friend of mine uh, of ours used to say, "You can really know a town from inside if you know it through its sewers." Yeah, yeah that's actually true. Yeah, there's a lot of connection. Think about it. The Toilets, oh no, yeah. of the politicians, <laughs> okay, yeah, are connected to the toilets of the poorest people in town through the sewers. That's the only connection, and the internet as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the club is the sewer of the society. I think perfect. The, <laughs> the, the right club is definitely a. Um, Zakman, so up, up, or sewer. Yeah, like it's, not, it's where the. Yeah, where everything flows at the end of the day. The goods and the bads and just, uh, you know. I don't know what's good there in the you know sewer. What's good in the sewer? <laughs> I mean, there are some... Some dump from a politician is good. <laughs> in, this, in these liquids, there are probably some uh, good uh, proteins as well. You know, <laughs> some <right>. jerking, jerking <laughs> okay, off into the toilet. Yeah, eh? What? Stop it. <laughs> no, 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 stop it. Okay. okay anyway. We go a couple of steps uh, back. We had. Uh, I, I told the story like a, um, a second ago about Kiev. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this there was this heroin junkie party. A friend of ours uh, mm -hmm. uh, t t told us about it. I will I will say no names now. But he was witnessing this party. They were playing at first like some hard stuff, then ambient stuff. And then the DJ himself was so high, was so like gone on heroin that he, w he was just standing there and playing white noise. He was playing white noise and there were like 20 to 30 guests, ravers, and they were all just standing on the dance floor listening to this white noise or but, not listening I but you know. know that like people have like some you know like uh fall asleep or meditation sounds yeah that are also white noise but it's a yeah, thing you told me that if yeah, you listen to white noise while working or something it kind of um takes your uh no uh, I, I, capability they say yeah. they say it works not for me it sounds <laughs> you don't like white noise not really but it actually sounds a bit if you like give it uh, give it a bit time it sounds like uh ocean yeah just like really violent ocean 
Maybe yeah. we should start some a techno team ASMR, uh, uh, you know, like lo-fi kind of. Uh. <laughs> 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 if you sample, okay, I think you cre you can create the the if you sample the noise of sniffing, you can probably create nice white noise, and it's like literally white noise. If you consume Stitch. white things, yes. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. Okay, so uh, enough. Okay. Enough with the unhealthy stuff. Okay. From this is the point where we, where we try to go to the healthy part of this episode. So keep the fun aside. You know, yeah, yeah. Getting serious. Fun again. is over now. Um, maybe come. Let's come back to our to our uh, raver beginnings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is also completely unhealthy. To be honest, our beginnings, our <laughs> first experiences were super unhealthy. Also because we were like completely uh, unconscious to what we were doing. We we're just going with the flow, you know. Yeah. You were working uh, as a barkeeper. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to tell us. Yeah, I worked about. like in as a bartender. I wouldn't say like nightlife, but basically it is nightlife. If you it work from nightlife. midnight till 6 a.m. or 8 a.m., whatever, of it's course. basically nightlife. And yeah, so some 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 day, like a friend of mine in the bar, we were, my colleague, okay, mm -hmm. said like, okay, let's go after the shift, let's go partying, and I'm like, okay, let's go. I never did it because I was like pretty conservative at that time. I was like working, studying, and like for the protocol, you're still conservative. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> yeah, and I I always thought like, no, partying is not for me and whatever. But I always like wanted to live actually the Wolf of Wall Street lifestyle, you know, this douchebag kind of lifestyle and yeah. like all this we all uh, drug abuse, uh, fun, you know, but the, back then it was like, I was like super sober and stuff. Yeah. And once he took me and I'm like, whoa, this is like kind of nice and stuff. It's, uh, was that Watergate? Yeah, it was Watergate <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, funny. Yeah. What can I say? And then I like basically said like, let's go come, uh, come with me. You said, yeah, I remember it from back in the days. Yes. But I you like quit already because you've been like already married there and stuff, <laughs> I guess. So, and so then we, when I was going? 18, 19, 20, yeah. like in these three years, I was partying in Berlin, but I was partying, partying on the more shicky yeah. uh, part. I was going to Watergate. I was going to at these times picnic cookies. Uh, places that were but not hip-hop exclusive boundaring platform. they were boundaring with electronic music yeah. and queer culture and like uh, fashion high society and also had a part of uh, hip-hop uh, the hip-hop scene there so they were kind of good actually but they weren't the underground uh, technoculture preserving places that we that we like nowadays that we also criticize nowadays but the places that we hang more um yeah, so you took me, uh, you took me back in. I yeah, was like yeah, yeah. years. Outside. Pulled him back in, <laughs> and he stayed you there. You want to go we out? In the, yeah, <laughs> I think in Berlin it's almost inevitable if you like to go out, if you're an yeah. outgoing person, and you like dancing and music and just having, a, you know, n not even if you live the Wolf of Wall Street lifestyle, but if this wildness uh, always kind of calls you and you want um, to take some steam out. Uh, Berlin is uh, first of all the, probably the, the best way to do so if you just need a, a city relief yeah. uh, without going outside somewhere or a festival or whatever and uh, after years of being uh, dry I would say uh, you you pulled me back in I take complete responsibility for my actions yeah, 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 it's not like you pulled I me I take responsibility for my actions <laughs> I know what I did <laughs> Okay, so I started <laughs> hanging at your bar a couple of times yeah. and then uh, we started uh, going to uh, a damn place called Kitty Chang. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Kitty Chang is uh, also like a cult, uh, cult place in Berlin already. It has nothing to do with techno culture. It's more about uh, like uh, playing radio music and, and hip hop and stuff. But, it's yeah, but it was right status. next to the bar I worked. Yeah, it was just next to your bar. It was, it was there and it was easy. So we started going there. But we felt straight away like after one to visit that it's not enough when we need to go to next level so we went to watergate the, pro the problem is also that i was working till four five yeah. six a.m ish yeah and where do you go partying that at that time you know yeah. it's like <laughs> basically morning the next day so you yeah. have to go to an electronic like techno now club, that you're basically. saying it i think the the clubs in berlin are basically the place for the night workers that why you, yep. that's why you sometimes see sex workers at, yeah, always, at yeah. the yeah. end of the and club night for example and you have bartenders yeah, and sure. uh, strippers and whatever yeah you have uh these night people so see 
seeking themselves also for for like for this relief for this uh, steam uh, how, how would you call it steam steam hold <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so we're on a search 4 a.m balance huh? 4 a.m kitty chang is about to close yeah because yeah, yeah. it's like a pretty mainstream people don't hang there on i'll say this on alcohol you're not, you're, you're I not think really. They, 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 there was not only alcohol there. Yeah, yeah. There's powders as well, but not in the way you'd see it in a, yeah. in a, in a techno club. But uh, people there are not able to hold a lot because, yeah. uh, first of all, alcohol is a downer, and people get tired and boozed. And uh, after 4 a.m., they're kind of breaking. And also young, so you know you need to be a, an experienced raver to start your night at four. Which we also don't do anymore, but we can. But go. we did. <laughs> we used to start at four, yeah. We used to start our, our evenings Just at four. So bullshit now. Thanks yeah. to Corona. Yeah. We have like this, like uh, party starts at twelve again, and you leave yeah. at twelve next <laughs> day. <laughs> but still, this four a.m. coming to a party shit, I don't like it. Yeah, because you, you 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 just you arrive already not fresh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And biologically, it doesn't really matter. You say you're a night owl. You say you're a morning person. I'm gonna tell you uh, a universal truth that I learned. We are, yeah, don't tell anybody this <laughs> universal truth. Uh, we are all uh, morning types. We just, uh, a lot of us don't like the morning, but the sun is what sets our biological clock and we work better, concentrate better during the day. If we had a good night's sleep, another secret here, a lot of secrets revealing today. If you tend to consume at a party and you had a good night's sleep, and you start your party during the day, like for example, the old Berkheim goers that always go on a Sunday daytime, 12, 13, and yeah, that's the time to go. By the way, don't tell us anybody, yeah? That's the secret In case time. you didn't know. In case you didn't know, <laughs> yeah? Why do they call it the church? Most of the people go there on Sunday daytime. That's the time where you go to church. That's the time where you can go to this ecstasy feeling of being fresh, like fully awakened, and uh, uh, the, the effect of your consumption will also be more powerful because your body has resources to give you. So yeah, it's always better to party during the day. If you want to go to the night, go into the night. But if you come after a work day, especially a shift like you had, yeah, yeah. or you also maybe drink during the shift and you had just a normal day before that. Maybe, maybe you also consume during the shift. I yeah. Want, <laughs> I, want, I want to incriminate anybody, but... <laughs> But you don't want to check the toilets. Uh, you, you don't want to check those. Uh, the, they discovered. I, I was working in a pretty much coke bar there. I swear to God. Yeah. And no, not gonna lie. Hardcore so, life. You were studying. Yeah. You were working. You were partying, and uh, and all this time you were yeah, consuming alcohol, all cigarettes. This time. Alcohol, <laughs> yeah, alcohol, alcohol cigarettes, cigarettes. Yeah, every day. Yeah. I didn't talk about the rest. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So where, where where did we go next? We uh, we were. Uh, we were uh, so hip hop barring, then we were watergating, okay. which is watergate is like more uh, house, tech house, and then it approaches kind of the techno, and then Sisyphus. Uh, we come to Sisyphus at about also 2018. See those huge lines, queues. Uh, I mean, I mean the yet lines of people, yeah, uh, <laughs> like hundreds of people queuing in Sisyphus when it's this, when it's in season. It's not smaller than uh, Berkheim. It's uh, not, man. It's but the you. Sisyphus is the place where I learned line cutting for you to know. You just Again, go straight to the toilets. The people and or then, uh, no, line cutting yeah. in uh, the queue, cut, cut the queue. Q, sorry. Okay, yeah. So you go to the toilets on the right, if they're still there, I don't know, and yeah. just pretend like you're coming out of the toilet into the queue and yes. you're there. Yeah, you've been here there the whole time. Don't be a tourist. Yeah, so uh, two extra tips for newcomers. Uh, most of the old goers cut the line which i hate i hate it <laughs> but because the because of the pretentiousness of the of the of, i don't know if it's the mix of the scene the germanness of the people it's the germanness 100 the germanness people are afraid to, to yeah people are afraid to criticize you publicly they're afraid to be loud in front of the bouncers or the other ravers so a lot of people use that and really cut the line hard. They cut it in Berkheim, they cut it in Sisyphus, they cut it in almost every club in the world. I saw the same shit in uh, Vienna, uh, but in Vienna they had like, they decided in one point there at Grelle Forella. I thought it was like, um, 
I heard so much about this club was I'm sorry was a was a disappointment for me in terms of uh, raving and, and and culture and so on like everything the infrastructure the toilets the the the, the line so one one dude decided to cut the line the then line the, in the toilet or no no, the, no the line to the club <laughs> itself the queue to the <laughs> the the queue some dead jokes yeah. here. <laughs> One dude, so, uh, first of all, the toilets there are like segregated. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's like men, women separately, only separately. That's not the place for me. Yeah, it's not like you have, okay, it's okay to have a flinter toilet. It's perfect, yeah, but if in case just uh, somebody needs the, the, the toilet more than it, what it's normally used for. But mm -hmm. uh, it's boys and girls and it's being completely guarded. And uh, I mean, come on, let's be honest. Uh, we're, we know why we came for and we know what we're doing so but Galeforello is a, like a techno club or something yeah right? Galeforello okay. is considered to be uh, the club in Vienna okay. and um, I know now th there are a lot of new places and uh, we're exploring it ourselves right now and finding out more about the spaces there but Galeforello is the name you know I heard also from uh, there was this podcast with uh, also I think Garnier this famous uh, French DJ Garnier he says he said, uh, for me, Galeforelle is the best club in Europe. And I, I had to see it afterwards. And what I saw uh, didn't convince me, didn't give me any other vibes than uh, Mykonos would, uh, would, give, would give me. So I'm sorry, Galeforelle, you, you have to work on your infrastructure. Sound is okay. And you, they have some nice bookings. Freddie K even played in Galeforelle for like a short time ago. Patrick played there. But yeah, as an infrastructure and a, and a raving uh, kind of space, uh, not acceptable. Um, so this guy uh, cuts the line, then the other one cuts the line, and then the line turns from a straight Q line from to a a... Into a pyramid. Okay, okay. <laughs> who's going to jump first? And it, it just reminded me of my home country, which is uh, yeah, Israel, by the way, where people respect, uh, where have zero respect to, to queues and lines. And uh, yeah, didn't remind me of uh, Vienna. But to be honest, Austria is way more kind of uh, temperamentful than, uh, than, than, than Berlin and Germany. The, the Austrian people are way more, uh, uh, they have, uh, how should I say, they, they round the corners, you know? But do you mean like, you know, actually German people living yeah. in Berlin or like people that we know that are... 90% or 99% that you say that I was this is a whole subject here. of itself you know who's Berliner who is in the scene who is not the scene yeah. who has seen the scene you know but I mean because Berlin Berlin like Berliners or Germans they are from Berlin like yeah. they're like also pretty outspoken and like loving yeah. and stuff you know outspoken, maybe you've seen direct. Austria more of them you know yeah. here you don't see them that much you know yeah maybe the bounce of Berlin is from Berlin and the rest of it is like uh, just like yeah. random tourists that are coming there and uh, thinking that uh, he's like brick face or something you know but yeah like all people you're you know? absolutely right i think uh, people that are newcomers to berlin see the facade but because they first of all don't uh, they don't flow in the language for example yeah. a lot of people that come here just don't speak german for obvious reasons or for other reasons berlin is still the capital of germany yeah. and everybody speaks here german and um, a lot of uh, local berliners just don't speak English and that's okay that's yep. completely okay and we're still not a colony not officially a colony of America I'm saying this because I grew up in a colony of America so it's okay for for Germans not to speak uh, English and people coming from outside can only get a part of the whole picture if they cannot communicate with the locals in their local way of in their local pro programming uh, language yeah, you get to understand German at least to the get the vibe you yeah know? Totally. And as you said, could be that the, the, the bouncer is way nicer than you think because you see his face, but you cannot have a small talk with him. Yep. And I totally agree that Berliners, especially East Berliners, but also West Berliners, they have the, what we call a große Fresse, or which is just a, a, a big <laughs> face, but in a good way. They're open, they're sincere, they say what they think. You know, so I find it to be a good thing because this is maybe the authenticity that I usually miss with Germans, you know, especially when communicating with people from Bavaria, people from Baden-Württemberg that are actually the newcomers in Berlin, like the Schwaben and so to say, they come from a little bit of a different culture than the Berliners, which grew in this contra of West and East, and they are not afraid to speak their hearts out. So for those people who think that uh, like the techno scene or, the, or that the, the, the local scene is snobbish, hard, gray, 
learn the language first. <laughs> you know, this sounds totally out there what I'm saying. Right yeah, now, I mean, yeah, it sounds, but like yeah, there's a different layer that you can unlock to all yeah. this uh, conversation, you know, if you just like can interact with these people. Yeah, authentically. Like, authentically, you know. Yes. Yes. But like a lot of people like uh, not learning German anyway because everybody speaks English here. I know there's yeah. a lot of people like locals that don't speak, but they're like living in complete different uh, districts, you know, like in Kreuzberg, I think a free sign, everybody speaks English. There, yeah. you know? Which reminds me that I suggested and I think we should do it. Uh, we're going to do a tough love special on German in German. <laughs> tell us what you think about it yeah, maybe, maybe we do a spin-off podcast but i don't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> but we can do it anyway. i would definitely like to to and also maybe have a guest that uh, would prefer to communicate in german you know subtitles yeah, sure. are still a thing you can know? we can we invite uh shoki 287 shoki 287 maybe we should invite um one of the bouncers you know one of the local bouncers here yeah that sure why likes not? to communicate in german Sure. And to show uh, his or hers um, real facade, you know. Actually, they, they did it. The, no. Actually, there was like something like that already. Yeah. Uh, Tell me more. I will send you. I don't know. I've yeah. seen just like a, a small bit, but I think it was in English. Okay. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. Cool. That's some ideas. Write us in the comments if you're interested in stuff like that, and we yeah. will make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. So uh, we've talked a little bit about our uh, raving uh, beginnings and uh, the pandemic. We can connect both of those uh, subjects right now and just just travel a little bit forward into the future from 2019 to 2020, 21. Uh, we're pitching our techno team idea. It's kind of born already. We're ravers with no... We're homeless ravers at that time because we have no club to go to. We started doing some small gatherings in our studio, playing some music, thinking about the future of this uh, culture and so on and so on. And then we land in Kiev, which is like uh, for us for, for a couple of years, especially like, especially now with the war, but also especially before, before the war started, that was the holy grail of raving. And uh, we came to the city uh pitching our idea was like almost a random meeting that we had there had nothing to do with the techno world or the world of electronic music and through our uh, good friend at that time through social media shout out uh, katya vlasova uh, who took us in into the, the the club she was part of kela which means seller in german which is a funny thing because ukrainians uh, love naming stuff in german because it gives it a uh, a techno vibe <laughs> just gives it a european vibe and i and we like it yeah it was good yeah you come to the club you see club mate you see jägermeister you feel at and home. you feel like home yeah, <laughs> yeah you feel like home in your keller <laughs> yeah so we this night we we got rejected with our with our not in the club we got rejected for our pitch our idea didn't go that well and we were pissed off and it was we shit said, <laughs> we need to say yeah, it like that it was, was shit so it was we had to re <laughs> It was something yeah it was something but it was not something that we do now yeah anyway so it was like completely to be different honest, yeah. i don't want to tell too much it kind of what we do now 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 or already resembles back to the first pitch to be maybe, honest maybe maybe I maybe we need to dig out some shit and see yeah, uh, I see one it, more time it does. I, don't know. I think it does okay so basically the circle started there at least and we went we went to this tour we went to kela uh totally beautiful experience you stay outside industrial zone wooden gates a huge uh, door guy two meters uh, kind of a soviet soviet dude looks at us everything is empty you don't like see in the bushes it was like you're going uphill in the bush wait, so wait, 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 wait. the bushes the before that we stay on the main street and there are just gates and there are no other people just two other boys or something that are trying to get in and he's like not even talking to them and then i come to him and i'm like uh, I definitely didn't look like a club entrance. No, it, it looked does, it like fucking, uh, yeah. they're gonna kill us there. Yeah, you know, yeah, like behind the, the huge uh, wooden <laughs> gates. It's not like Sisyphus, you have the huge gates, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ducks. And, and you hear like, music or something. You, you, <laughs> you see the festival. Yeah, so yeah. There you see nothing, only like bushes, as you said. Pitch black. Pitch black, yeah. No Forest, lighting. basically. So we started talking to him and he's like, who are you? Uh, we said, we're from Berlin, of course. So we come and we said from Berlin and we think that this will get us into any club in Kiev. And he's like, uh, I don't care. And then we said, we're from Katya. And uh, he called her and she came to, to pick us in. 
uh, you walk for like I don't know 300 meters or something, and then you re reveal unveil this uh, this like uh, uphill and downhill yeah, and then this <laughs> whole club that used to be a dumpster and uh, was b rebuilt into this uh, beautiful space outside inside. We had a beautiful trip there, may, made some new friendships as always, and um, these people took us to the next place. They they told us there is a club that was uh, opened by built by germans it's an and ominous if germans. you are germans that you would then you would love this club and we're like yeah well then let's go to the german club and uh, yeah we went to this club both of us were i can just say we were shit faced and uh, we were also dressed improperly at that time so it's not about how we were dressed but it was more about our attitude we were yeah. very uh, our attitude was just uh, bad because we were we were thinking this was just a normal Ukrainian club that like like a trashy mainstream club and we were like you gonna let us in or what and uh, it turned out to be for us the best club in the world for us personally um, they didn't let us in of course the first time which I think is a very important part of the journey. I swear. As soon as they didn't let us in, we recalculated and thought, why? And from there, we continued to, uh, to the, the, the next club, which is the first club in uh, the oldest club in Kiev, closer. We had a beautiful time there in the outside area. Uh, and then we, we can tell more about this later. After being rejected in that club, that became a big mysterium. The, we found out that's, that's the, that the club is called the club with no name or the club that doesn't exist or K41. And... We started coming back to Kiev. This town kind of uh, sucked us in. We started doing projects there. We started uh, creating content, content there and connecting with the, the locals. And uh, of course, we, we became uh, resident ravers of, of, of K41. It was the most beautiful place for us to go to, especially in the pandemic times. Even dancing with masks, which was a strict thing during the... Uh, I think there's only once that it was like in... Yeah. in but like once that we experienced, but yeah, they had yeah. months, yeah, yeah, months yeah, yeah. and months they, of they parties. They had months where, of it, but like only one party. Where yeah, we had, we had to really like masks. party with, with masks, but still the people, they were so... From our perspective, from our Berlin uh, perspective, coming from a place where at that time only super illegal raves happened and the scene was either way oversaturated and the people already forgot why they were raving you had a place like that where people put all of their efforts and their knowledge and their hope and their f emotions into the dance floor and into building those dance floors and it was just so beautiful and inspiring and amazing to to watch and to be a part of it and our love to this place grew bigger and bigger. Marky is, uh, he has uh, strong roots there. His uh, family is from Kiev, mine is from Odessa originally. So we both are uh, genetically connected to, to those or geographically, geogenetically uh, <laughs> connected to those uh, places. And I don't want to be too esoteric, but we felt a very strong connection. And why am I telling all of this? I want to connect to our uh, special part of the episode now. Yeah. At one of our visits at K41, which was uh, probably my personal best uh, best visit there, where I saw their special outdoor uh, floor, the, the backyard, and I was so inspired and so amazed by it. And the people that were there that day was, I think, 21st of June uh, 2021. Yeah. And 26, I, I think. Yeah. Huh? 26, 26, 21st or 26th of June, yeah. 2021, and uh, this is this was the, the the rave where I saw Rob for the first time. I was uh, like at the end of the rave, I was I was looking and he was dancing on uh, on this uh, on this platform. There's a platform where you can like be in a. It's like a, uh, an amphitheater where you can see people. You can observe others. Like without being uh, yeah pervert, you could just dance, watch other people dance, watch the DJ, and it's all in a kind of a sphere that everybody can consume these pictures and, and be a part of it. Just uh, just to shorten it down, yeah, this dance floor is the by far the best dance floor that you ever gonna see in your life, and you won't see it because photos are not al uh, allowed. Yeah, but so you have to see it for yourself if you, by if you far, can make it the craziest dance floor ever it's an open open air dance floor but still i think i never seen some shit yeah. like this anyway. uncomparable sorry berkine uncomparable to your garden so it's basically everybody. same same yeah, yeah, it's, uh, roots it's, but it's, it's, it has the crazy. same roots it has the same uh roots of basics of aesthetics and knowledge and uh, 
at this point i want to say a big shout out to to nikita and the team of of, of studio kahat or i don't know who exactly was uh, i think nikita was uh, responsible for for this idea of, who also of, the, of did the backyard the studio, who, by the who way. also did the studio so the best dance floor in the world was <laughs> <laughs> kind of envisioned by the same people as this space so big big shout out to those talented and uh and 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 uh, super serious visioners of of uh, yeah of architectural uh, uh, art art yeah uh so we were at the backyard uh, this idea of the backyard was just another extra info was born like accidentally it was supposed to be one floor and then they decided just to make a something out of this space and yeah it became a genius idea crazy <laughs> so now finish off we're on yes. time a bit i think yes, so we're on and time. i need to go to the toilet we met robbie we just uh yeah it was just a brief uh, brief uh, kind of uh first uh first uh eye contact crush crush yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i didn't met him that day so yeah yeah, yeah because i was out of order you I were already out and you went home and then i saw him on okay, this okay, terrace okay. this platform dancing and i thought this uh, person his uh as a persona definitely and somebody that uh, i would like to capture as we usually do when we see a picture that we want to save and just uh, i think a month or two later i i um uh, contacted him already in berlin i thought i didn't know who he was i thought he was actually post-soviet i thought he was ukrainian or something else definitely and, looked like it uh, yeah yeah i thought it was he was polish maybe it doesn't matter it's my profile yeah, yeah. And I contacted him and then uh, we decided to do our first uh, project together. Uh, I think it was a daydream, I yeah, think. Yeah, which went nuts. So yeah, the video so went good. nuts. It was the end of uh, 21. Everyone uh, liked it. We loved it. We loved working with Rob. Super easy, super uh, positive, always uh, always like giving uh, energy to everyone in, in the team. And we were filming in the cold outside, like uh, in this uh, underground passage uh, where they used to, where they filmed Hunger Games and a lot of other stuff. And Robbie was holding on like, uh, like a hero. We came into the studio. Rob was not a professional dancer, just for your information. He was never a professional dancer, but still in all his, his body cells, and I'm a professional dancer, I consider him a dancer because he was letting him himself go. He was like uh, conducting sound through his body. And for me, this is the definition of a dancer. He doesn't have to do it professionally or to teach or to study it. For me, Rob was a dancer because he was conducting sound through his body. And uh, so I loved how he moved, but we had to kind of somehow compress it into the, the, the camera. And people, when they perform for the first time in front of the camera, is, it's it's just hard, you know, yeah. you, 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 you don't feel so confident if you haven't trained before. So we went in our studios and I observed him. We danced together and I just observed what he was doing. And I tried to extract from uh, Rob a choreography or moves that for me were representing how he moved. And I kind of taught him back what he already knew you know <laughs> and uh, then uh, we took it in front of the camera and the people went crazy for it and at the end it was just yeah um, uh, a, a presentation of uh, of rob's aesthetic of course with the help of our friends from the code who dressed him up and so on and uh, shout outs to the godfather to of fetish the, gra <laughs> the what the godfather of fetish door the godfather of fetish in of Berlin. kink i don't know what's appropriate to say yeah we'll ask him the godfather of fetish and the boss of kink <laughs> <laughs> i think he would hate that i'm saying yeah. it but anyway <laughs> and uh, deep inside he loves it <laughs> It's okay. So, uh, yeah, Rob, uh, as he is uh, himself or lo loved to, to, to say it, or as we always use this word, he was a symbiosis of a, of, of a lot of stuff uh, as a personality, but he also o always worked in a super nice uh, symbi symbiosis with, with other people. And one thing led to another. Uh, Rob did also selection in our party. He was always part of what we were doing. And uh, every, every time we saw each other at a, at a party or somewhere else, we always had a nice, good conversation. And uh, yeah, and at the end, he was, he was using the term uh, giving people tough love because he really liked uh, the educational part of, uh, of, of his learnings. He, he himself didn't come from the techno scene and became a part of it. So he wanted to give people this knowledge, especially you people that after he got famous through social media, people got, uh, started approaching him and really violating his, uh, his personal boundaries. And he tried to use this position in a good way and to tell people, hey, this is the border. If you want to go 
uh, I will not let you go behind it, yeah? And maybe you can learn something else for something from it for your next uh, confrontation with, with other people. This is what he called tough love in his uh, view. And I told him once, we told him once, I, I, we met for a beer or something. I think we had Ramen and uh, Kreuzberg, yeah. Uh, it was last year. And I told him, hey, our conversations that we have in the backstage and uh, uh, <laughs> backstage or how you call yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our conversations that we have spontaneously or spontan, uh, spontan like he liked to say, um, these could maybe be recorded and uh, shared with people so, so you can, uh, you know, we can show people tough love on a bigger platform than just telling something to a person that just approached you on a rave. You can go on a bigger scale and then see if people uh, find this uh, uh, information uh, useful. And they did. We filmed two episodes right, right straight away after one after the other. And uh, the first one was uh, a, a bit slow at the beginning. And then the second one went viral. And we said, okay, this is a topic that is interesting. We started developing it. And Rob was super happy about it. He was super happy to unveil another part of his personality. Because people were always thinking, oh, this big guy, pumped up, techno chains, so tough. Even on our, on our first videos with him, he still looked very tough. A little bit queer as he was, but also like tough and unreachable. And the podcast, the idea of the podcast was to show that, hey, yeah, maybe for some people we're tough. Maybe we have our, but we have, we, we are full of tough love, you know, and uh, we're full. You're good? Yeah, I just. Uh, you're checking? I'm checking and I need to go to the toilet. So I swear to God. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. It's already over an hour, you know. So okay. let's, let's uh, get the fi uh, finishing thoughts. Sorry yeah, so uh, I think we, 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 we're going to mention, we're going to maybe tell some more stories about Rob and, uh, in, the, yeah. in the next episodes. But, but, but it was very important to us to, to make this uh, connection and to tell the, the story of how this all came together yeah. and how this was all happening like in the last couple of months. Uh, I can tell you from my knowledge and perspective that Rob was super enthusiastic about the next episodes of Tough Love. He was anticipating them and on the day that we found out that he passed away, it was actually one day before we were supposed to shoot the next episode. So everything came at a, in a big boom to, to us and we're still... Um, uh, processing it and we still don't know what's the right thing to say and what's the wrong to this thing to say but we can just say that it was uh, till now it was a beautiful process it was a beautiful uh, journey that we had with him we're very happy that we had this uh, uh, chance and we will do our best as I said at the beginning we will do our best to keep his legacy going and to 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 try and to imagine and uh, what how he would uh, want it to, to be and uh, and uh, yeah, we will uh, definitely have uh, have him in, in our in our hearts uh, forever and in, in our spirits. And um, I hope, uh, yeah, I hope that we can uh, that we can uh, continue this storyline the, the the best the best and most authentic way possible, and to keep giving this tough love uh, with no compromises in the future. Yeah, so that's uh, how we do. <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel. I, do we want to talk about like our personal feelings or something about it? Or do we, we want to start? Like, we have like a bit time, or, or it's for next time. Or how you, I would like to hear about your personal. I, feelings I don't know, about man. It, man. I, I, you know, I don't want to sound. I don't know. It's just so difficult to talk about your emotions about it because I don't know, man. I, I would say, I feel. We are very odd. I don't know. It's like the first time for me, like something like this happening. Yeah. Like uh, basically, like a peer uh, passing away. Yeah. And uh, since then, I don't know. I mean, I hate smoking weed, for example. But since then, I like started again. And I don't know. I'm not super good with like dealing now with these emotions. I think. Uh -huh. And I want just maybe to tell for the listeners, the viewers, or whatever. So if you have like tough times you know talking about your emotions maybe you need to talk to your friends or something you know and uh, you know being more more with your friends or something or, or with the relatives or something you yeah. know being to kind loving, of digesting yeah. don't feel like you're getting like alone with your feelings or stuff you know or like consciously do what you do you know i know that i'm now like using weed as like to numb myself from what 
what's like what's happened you know mm -hmm. since then but yeah this is how i feel i feel like a bit i feel like weird i don't know yeah it it's feels like super weird it. it feels super weird you kind of you, okay you accept the reality yeah, you yeah, don't, yeah. Uh, we're already behind this phase they are like uh, phases of grief yeah, and so yeah, yeah. on and uh, we already accepted the reality but still it's uh, a super unusual uh, feeling and uh, a lot of mixed feelings and thoughts and uh, that's a very good advice that you say staying in the circle of uh, people that uh, that give you that empathy and people that you can openly talk with uh, about it and uh, you should definitely not be afraid to, to open up there is nothing wrong about being fragile and nothing wrong about being for some part of your life in a broken phase. You can yeah. be broken and you can pick up those, uh, uh, how do you say? Shards. Shards? Shards? No, yeah. shards is when you fart and a little bit of shit comes out. It's okay. <laughs> what the fuck, man? Shard. Okay, okay. That's okay. a shard. Okay, uh, keep it positive. You know? At the end, what he wants to say, life is Kaizen. <laughs> as our Life good friends kaizen. define kaizen everyday again, progress right yeah, yeah. everyday progress you know you have a bad day but the next day will be better yeah or maybe the next second will will eventually be better you know like especially like what i learned like from all the drug abuse that i did uh it's like you know all the bad feelings are temporarily and all the good feelings are also temporarily Everything that's like some temporary. truth that you need to acknowledge yeah. and like not to be too you know sad not sad about but this is like some life life wisdom that you need to accept yeah. i think like know? tom hanks said it in this uh, yeah. round of actors they had like de niro and yeah. uh, jamie fox and, and tom hanks says uh, he explained the the principle of uh this shall also pass i think yeah, it was yeah, called yeah. yeah this will pass this will pass the, the grief and the good feelings so yeah it's just a phase I think just the major problem with uh, consumption, and uh, I will always uh, keep that uh, hard line of criticism towards myself mm. and towards my co-ravers, is that the thing is about consumption. For example, you use weed now to numb yourself or other people use alcohol or whatever yeah, to yeah, numb yeah. their feelings when they're grieving. The problem is with the consumption of any substances, even if it's paracetamol or like any other legal, uh, even legal like uh, Xanax or whatever, mm -hmm. they shrink your resource for dealing with stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. when you use a substance as doping for your feelings, yeah. you afterwards have to emotionally recover and then you have, and your body uses the resources. I need to recover. I need, I need more dopamine. I need more this and this and this and this. I need sleep. Your body uses those resources to recover. And then you have less resources free for the next shit. Yeah, for the true. next challenges. So everything seems like a huge problem suddenly. You get a fine for your parking, your parking ticket, 10 euros, 15 euros. Oh my God, how am I going to pay it? You get like a letter from a finance, letter from the electric, uh, electricity company. From the Ausländerbehörde. From the Ausländer. <laughs> God, if I would get a letter from the Ausländerbehörde. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. I, I swear to God, I can't ever. Like cold sweat. And I'm already permanent in Germany. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I just think that the biggest problem of drugs, even bigger than the effect on your body, is the after effect on your emotional yeah. capability yeah. With, of, of dealing with, like, yeah. with dealing with problems. Yeah, yeah. but nobody's perfect. Nobody's and, perfect. Uh, you know, we do it are definitely not perfect. Yeah, and we can exactly we can enrich our consciousness and be aware of those things, and then we can choose yeah. how we pick our path. Yeah, you know and. Uh, Rob didn't say it. Uh, no, but nobody could, say, could could say it better than Rob in his name, like in his nickname. Kaizen yeah. means everyday small progress, especially for people who consume and want to get out of it. People who don't consume and still are completely depressed and don't know how to get out of it. Every day, just a little bit. You have to see the whole picture. You know. At this point, that's a good end because <laughs> I can't take it anymore. Marky has to uh, go to the. Third. <laughs> you know, this is just a classical fucking Marky because at every rave, <laughs> at every rave, I don't know what happened to his bladder. 
kids don't try this at home what yeah, he does <laughs> yeah. because yeah when we party he goes to the toilet like 30 13 times 30 yeah and again <laughs> so uh yeah at this point uh, go to the toilet you're yeah. free thank you for uh, being with us and uh, feel free to share any opinions uh, tell us uh, what you think about our uh, uh, tandem and uh, stay tuned for the next episode peace and well <laughs> subscribe <laughs>